Hey guys, today we'll be taking a look at a build your own battery kit from Basin Green, otherwise known as Shenzhen Basin. The kit I have here is designed to fit the EVE 230 amp hour lithium iron phosphate cells, and it includes everything you need to build your own battery, allowing you to purchase cells from a distributor of your choice. We're going to go over all of the components included, and then we're going to put together a battery using these EVE 230 amp hour cells that I purchased from Shenzhen Basin approximately three years ago. So you may remember that I pulled these out of service approximately one year ago for no reason other than I was rebuilding, restructuring my battery shed, um, and I just haven't had a chance to put them back in yet. So uh, having one of these kits available is a perfect opportunity to get these guys back in service. This is quite a large case here. It measures in at 17 inches in width, 10 inches in height, and 24 inches in depth, not including the terminals on the front. On the front here, we have two large positive terminals and two large negative terminals. They do look like they are M8 bolts. Uh, we have an on-off power switch here. We have a display for our BMS, a series of buttons. We have a grounding screw. And then we have some BMS communications ports, some state of charge indicators, and some uh, status indicators for your power, your running state, and your alarm. It is all the standard components you would find on a rack mount battery. Taking a look inside the case here, we can see there are two compartments for cells. You'll put eight cells in the top, eight cells in the bottom. And then we have a PCB or a printed circuit board running atop the cells. And this is going to have the connections for our balance leads. These support braces are bolted in with two bolts in the back each, and there's also a support brace in the center here, bolted to the front and the rear of the case, so there's plenty of structural support for the cells. Uh, these balance leads are soldered onto the PCB. I don't necessarily like this joint, it just seems like it may be a little weak. Most of them are held down with what appears to be hot glue, but some of the glue has fallen off, uh, so maybe, maybe covering these with some silicone would be a good idea. Taking a look at the front here, we have our main positive and our main negative conductor. The cables are covered in some heat wrap here, but it does appear to be a silicone insulated cable. And I do believe it's a number four based on the sizing. There's some glued heat shrink at the end and some nicely crimped on lugs. So the main positive is going to go on the positive post of the battery. And then there's a negative cable here that will go on the negative post of the battery. The negative is comprised of two cables, which may be uh, number sixes, I'm guessing, based on the thickness of them. Not 100% sure. There is a lot of stuff to see on this BMS here, and I can't really make out what brand it is. It sort of looks like a Pace BMS, but I don't think it is. It might be Basin's own version of it, their own variant. Uh, like I was saying, here is the main negative that comes off the battery. It goes into the BMS on the B- terminal. This heat sink will have the transistors that turn the battery on and off for charging and discharging and then it goes out to the main negative terminal. We have our positive cable here for the power of the BMS. Uh, these red conductors are feeding the communications ports down here on the bottom in the state of charge indicators. We have our power on off switch, which is the on off switch is connecting down here on the uh, communications part of the board. We have a bulk of temperature sensors here, which we can place around the battery once we have finished building it. Uh, we have a small temperature sensor sticking off of the board. And then lastly, we have our balance leads, the red one going up to the first PCB and the black set going up to the second PCB. And then I also see there's a small Bluetooth dongle down here right in the front. Uh, so let's take a look at the rest of the accessories. We have a large pack of flexible bus bars. These are the bus bars that are comprised of several layers of copper and then a layer of, I believe it was nickel on the ends. Um, along with a large collection of serrated flange nuts for the battery posts. We have a bag of bolts for the front terminals. We have some plastic terminal covers for the front. Uh, we have a communications cable. It appears to be a USB to, I guess that's RS-232. Uh, we have a set of two rack gears. Uh, we have a very large pile of epoxy board. These are gonna be for the bottoms and the sides of the batteries. And then we've got one piece of epoxy board for between each cell. Two dense closed cell foam pads, and these are going to be for the end of the battery pack, each battery pack. And two very nice positive and negative cables. These have to be about uh, two and a half to three feet if I had to guess, and they feel like number four. And with our lineup of accessories ready to go, it's time to go grab the cells. So the first thing you want to do is take your phone and scan this QR code on the front. It will open a web page that contains the installation instructions for this case, along with many other versions they sell. And I printed out a paper copy of that for myself here. 
I'm going to remove both of these top supports and these are different so you don't want to mix them up. You'll see they're labeled here. This one says B8 through B15. And the second one is labeled B1 through B7. This will go on the more negative side of the battery. There are six long pieces of epoxy board and you'll see that two of them are not as wide as the other four. Uh, the two that are less wide will be for the bottom. The wider four will go on the side of the batteries. So there's one for each side. And then one small epoxy board will go in the back of each row. And the documentation has a diagram here showing you where the positive and negative of each cell should be positioned. I'm going to start with the rear left side of the enclosure and it wants positive on the left. And these are the cells I'll be using. Like I said, I purchased them from Shenzhen Basin about three years ago now, uh, and they've been working very, very well. This terminal style is not the best because there's not a lot of surface area there. However, I do very much prefer this terminal style over the EVE 280s, the older style EVE 280 where there's threads bored down into the aluminum, and that's just terrible to work with. So, so for the first, it wanted positive on the left. And you can see from the diagram here, it basically alternates back and forth. So we have positive, negative, positive, negative, and so forth for all 16 of the cells. So next goes a piece of epoxy board, then positive on the right, epoxy board, cell, 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 epoxy board. Now this last cell will go in this space, followed by another epoxy board, followed by a foam pad. I think the easiest way to do this is going to be to take out these six screws in the front to pull out this piece of metal. And then once the cells are in place, we can put this back on. So now we've got the last cell, the epoxy board and the foam pad. And the right side is done the exact same as the left side. And with the cells all in place, I'm going to double check the orientation of everything and then I will very carefully put this plate back into place. All right, so the cells are in and I did end up leaving out the two pieces of foam. There is no way I was going to fit that foam in here. You can see how tight it is. And uh, it even squeezed the cells in a little bit when I was tightening the bolts down to the point where I was questioning if I should even put them in. Now you see they do fit nicely and these are used cells. These are cells that have been used for two years and sat for a third year. Uh, so they did expand just a tiny bit and they still fit, but I will caution you that if you do have expanded cells, you should never under any circumstance compress those cells um, once they have expanded. But if you've got new cells, brand new cells you're putting in here, uh, you shouldn't have any problem fitting these guys in. It just looks very professionally done as opposed to the way some of us are DIYing these builds with like fish paper and foam and all kind of stuff between them. So I really, really do like the look of it. And I'm going to put these uh, top support bars back into place. Now, we have a lot of exposed uh, battery terminals here and these are at a 0% state of charge, but you might be building one of these at 70% you know, state of charge or 100% state of charge. And I would really suggest avoiding constructing a battery at 100% state of charge. One mistake with a metal object like this could be disastrous. You could short the cells out. You could have pieces of molten metal flying, things like that. So you want to be extremely careful where you're putting stuff and follow common safety procedures such as wearing safety glasses and things like that. Making sure to select the correct top plate. This is the one that goes uh, B8 through B15 on the most positive side. And I'm ready for the second top cover. I'm making sure not to get any of the balance leads pinched underneath. Next, I'm ready to get the bus bars connected. And to do that, I'll be referring back to the diagram in the manual once again here. And each of these connections where you see a line drawn between the post is where a bus bar would go. So very carefully, I'm going to place the bus bar on the cells, double checking the connections as I go so I don't accidentally short out a cell. And then I'm taking the appropriate balance lead and placing it over one of the battery posts. And each one gets a serrated flange nut. I'll just run these down by hand first and then we'll come back and torque them later. The last one to drop in is the longer bus bar which will join the two packs together here in the rear. And now I'm going to be extremely careful because across these two terminals here, there could be as much as 58.8 volts. 
um, and that can and will shock you if I were to put my hand across this. I have my torque wrench set to 50 inch pounds. Now the documentation does not give a recommended torque for these bolts, but uh, I've selected 50 inch pounds based on my experience. You could probably go up a little bit more, but, uh, but that call is entirely up to you. If you're not sure, I would recommend checking with the manufacturer. So I've gone through each of these bolts and I've made sure they are torqued down to 50 inch pounds. And then I went through every bolt a second time. So now I should be able to take my multimeter here and place it on the positive and negative. And I've got 51.7 volts, perfect. Now we're ready to put the front panel and the BMS on. So I've removed the zip tie that was securing down the temperature sensors here. There are four temperature sensors. I connected the plug for the balance leads, or as the instructions say, the voltage acquisition wires. And I've also checked all the terminals where there are screws or bolts just to make sure they're tightened down and there are no mistakes. Uh, it never hurts to double check. And we can connect the positive lead for the power of the BMS. And then lastly, I just wanna make sure that the power switch is in the off position. I'm going to very carefully put this lid into place, making sure not to pinch any of the cables in the process. Now the instructions say to connect the main positive and negative before uh, you connect the balance leads. So first I'll do the positive. I have the positive lug and then I have the balance lead. And next I have the main negative and the negative balance lead. When connecting balance leads, it's always best to connect that of the lowest potential first. So I'm gonna use this black connector first since this is cells B1 through B8. And then I'm ready for the red connector which are cells B9 through B16. And the last piece of this are the temperature sensors. You can see I've run those right up the center here. Tried to zip tie them down so they stay uh, neatly bundled in place. And then I've just sort of slid them under the insulation of this top plate here. Ideally, you would use something like heat proof tape or silicone to affix them to the cells. All right, now the moment of truth. Will it turn on? So here we go, power on. Oh, we have a display and a beep. This display has a lot of useful information right on the front. We have our full voltage of 51.7. That's pretty much what we measure with the voltmeter, so that's spot on accurate. Zero amps, it's not charging or discharging. And this is our highest cell at 3.235 volts and our lowest cell at 3.227 volts. We have our highest temperature sensor, 23 degrees Celsius, and our lowest temperature sensor of 20 degrees Celsius. This is all the important information you'll wanna know right on the front screen. Then I see it says press menu. So let's see what we have in there. Okay, we got readings on all four sensors and our ambient temperature was the one sticking off the uh, BMS. And then our MOS temperature is gonna be the one on the transistors. Now remember, these cells have been sitting for about a year or more now. So they're all resting pretty close together. We'll have to give them a charge and see how they look when they are balanced. The last thing we'll do is take a look at the software for the computer and the parameters that are pre-programmed into this BMS. To do that, you'll need this black cable. And I made a mistake earlier. This is actually an RS-485 cable, not an RS-232 cable. Uh, so you see there's an RJ45 plug on one end and there's a USB on the other. So the first thing you need to do is down here on the ADD or addressing switch, switch number one needs to be in the up or the on position. The remaining three switches need to be in the down or the off position. And that will tell the battery two things. First, it will tell it to turn on the RS-485 port and start communicating. And second, it will tell the BMS that this is the first battery. So we'll go ahead and plug this cable to either one of the rightmost RS-485 ports and the other end into the computer. So I have the software downloaded here in the right hand window. Uh, and before we open the software, we're gonna set a couple of parameters. So you wanna locate the file that says set.txt. And line four is the language. It's set to Chinese by default. We wanna change that to English. And it's also defaulting to COM16 as a serial port. To find the serial port for the adapter you plugged in, you'll open the device manager. Under ports, COM and LPT, USB to serial, it says CH340, and you can see we are on COM10. So we'll go ahead and change that to COM10, and then click save. And then we can double click the executable and it does give a warning screen here. And you can see we've established communications with your BMS. So here we can see the voltages of all of the cells in the battery, along with the transistor status. So you can see charging and discharging is on, but we are not actively charging or actively discharging. So the one thing I wanna check in here is the parameter tab. The parameters I'd like to point out are the cell over voltage is 3.70. 
the overcurrent protection will kick in at 110 amps. For temperature protection, the low charging protection is at negative 5 degrees Celsius. And for the balancing, it will begin balancing at 3.45 volts when there is a voltage differential of 30 millivolts or more. A common misunderstanding here is the battery is not going to balance at 3.45 volts unless there is a differential of 30 millivolts. That means the highest cell has to be 30 millivolts or more away from the lowest cell. A lot of people seem to forget this differential part and they think it's always going to be balancing at 3.45 volts and that's not the case. Uh, so these are very healthy settings and I'm happy with what's programmed here. So that's about all there is to see in the software here. There is a multi-packs tab, so if you've got multiple of these batteries connected together, you can easily access all of the information from all of the batteries wired together. And that's, that's pretty much it. You just can't beat the ease of assembling one of these. They provide everything you need to put your battery together, other than the cells, of course. I do wish it had a circuit breaker on the front, not necessarily for overcurrent protection, but it does help with isolation if you've got several of these wired together in parallel. Now the one disadvantage here, and this applies to all these battery kits, not just this particular kit or this particular brand, and that is the sheer weight of the battery. This weighs around 200 pounds, and that's not going to be easily moved with one or even two people. You really need some sort of hydraulic lifting dolly or something where you can sort of lift it up and down easily and then wheel it around to where you want to install it once it's put together. These kits can be ordered through Alibaba. They don't have any U.S. warehouse stock, unfortunately. I did make the recommendation that they should stock some of these in a U.S. warehouse. Um, I think these kits and a lot of their products in general would sell a lot better. Uh, if there was a simple website to go where you can just order one, it calculates the shipping and then it's dispatched from a U.S. warehouse. They did tell me that their customer base seems to be shipping from the US to the European market, so that's kind of where they're focusing their effort at this point. I'm certainly not a marketing expert, but I think some of that has to do with the fact that some of their competition has their inventory in US warehouses for easy ordering and easy shipping. If you're looking to buy cells for your kit or just for anything in general, uh, 18650 Battery Store has some of the best cells around, in my opinion. These are their EVE 230 amp hour cells that I ordered from their website. Uh, I really like the terminal design on these. They have the laser welded aluminum blocks with two bolt holes each. If you do purchase these cells, you'll have to use the included rigid bus bars. Unfortunately, the flexible bus bars included in these kits uh, will not line up with the terminals on here. Um, I know you can go out and purchase flexible bus bars designed for these double bolt designed cells, uh, but that's just something to keep in mind. As always, please let me know what you guys think. Don't forget to hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.